Ben's crunched Veritech falls to the ground, while Rick and Max hold their empty gun pods, unsure if Ben even survived the assault. Rick is closest to this monster of his Entrati, his terrified voice calling out to Max to stay sharp. Max is amazed the same guy he tossed out an airlock is back. He can't even help but smile. He keeps his characteristic cool, telling Rick to let him handle this. But the Zentradi soldiers on the other side of the door have heard Commander Britai's war cry and rally inside the hangar, coming up behind Max, giving him plenty to deal with. And unlike he and Rick, they aren't out of ammo. Britai charges at Rick, weapon raised. Rick meets his challenge, but is easily disarmed by the giant warrior, his gun pod nearly crushing Lisa as it hits the ground. She gets up, but is immediately snagged by one of the Zentradi soldiers, who declares his capture of the female Micronian. Max sees them take Lisa, and overpowers the soldier who comes to him, intending to get Lisa back. But the other soldiers line up in front of the one holding Lisa in the bag, and they all open fire at Max. He leaps and converts to Guardian, avoiding their shots as they pursue. Rick is slammed to the ground by Britai, who intends to impale his Veritech to the ground with his pipe. Thinking fast, Rick raises his Battleoid's leg, using the booster of its foot to nearly melt off the other side of Britai's face. Rick presses this advantageous moment, grabbing Britai as his Battleoid soars through the air to fully body slam the fleet commander to the ground, pinning him. But only for a moment, as Britai returns the favor, picking up Rick's entire mecha without even a struggle, and tossing it hard. Rick is able to maneuver himself to land on his feet, but Britai rushes to meet him, punching him back a step, kicking him onto his back, and not even being close to done with him, Britai picks up the Battleoid by the arm and flings him into an empty rack on the wall, hard enough to pierce through the armored Veritech. Rick is shaken in the cockpit and near panic as he sees Britai still coming straight at him in his monitor. Unable to move his limbs, he refuses to give up, aiming the guns mounted on his head to fire at Britai. But the alien sees it coming, ducks, and reaches up blindly to crush the Battleoid's head with his bare hands. Ritai continues to tear away at Rick's Veritech, stripping off the armored chest and leaning in towards the cockpit window, looking for the Micronian inside, meeting eye to eye with his tiny opponent. Rick has only one choice left. Max sees Rick eject and be caught by the giant warrior and tries to fly in to assist. But Rick's damaged Veritech self-destructs next to Britai. He catches the explosion full body while the other side of it blows out the hull, catching Max in its decompression right before resealing. Britai lies on the ground, his uniform torn and burnt as his men approach him inquiring his condition. Commander, are you wounded? Commander Britai, are you all right, sir? I am not built quite as weakly as you are. Uh, you're right, of course, Commander. Well, so this is an enemy Micronian. Britai is certainly made of sterner stuff. He regards the small, fragile being in his hand, and he can't help but respect the fierceness with which he fought. Few foes have ever given Britai such a brawl, certainly never one so... miniature. He had personally seen to the great success of this operation, to capture not only one Micronian, but three. With that troublesome blue one out of the way, he takes these specimens to Exidor. 
Their unconscious bodies are placed in a chamber for study, with scans, readings, and samples already divulging fascinating findings to the small, scholarly Zentradi as he goes over the details with Britai. It was fortunate they were able to procure both male and female Micronians to get the full spectrum of their species. Exodor then relays to Britai the most revealing finding of this study. In addition, the skeletal, cellular, and genetic structures of these prisoners appear not to be much different from those of our own. Hmm. It's alarming. Ah, looks as if they're coming around. Yes. Ben, Ben, wake up! Ben! Ah, uh, don't wake me until it's time to eat. I mean, I know pilots should be able to keep their cool under pressure, but Ben takes that to a whole new level. Lisa also stirs, seeing Rick and wondering what the situation is. Rick is very quick to blame her for all of them being captured in the first place, which is pretty unfair. He actually starts leaning in pretty heavily to some rather sexist statements, arguing that certain assignments shouldn't be given to women. <laughs> Sheesh. Now, one could argue that it's just this particular woman that he resents, since she's been on his case since the day they met, and he's just going about it in a very passive-aggressive manner. I suppose we can chalk it up to the frustrations of the situation, which they both feel, but their argument escalates to great display for the Zentradi observing them. We find out the Zentradi segregated their males and females from each other long ago, which, according to Exodor, help to solve several similar such issues as they are currently perceiving in their captives. Watching this bickering between the male and female Micronian makes Britai feel nauseous. Seeing them interacting, his head and stomach begin to spin. Exodor admits to feeling the same, but this is precisely what makes the Micronians such a threat, this mysterious effect they seem to have on the Zentradi. Exodor advises that because of this, it is imperative they take these Micronians to be interrogated by the supreme commander of all the Zentradi, Lord Dolza himself. Meanwhile, Rick and Lisa continue their little spat. I shouldn't have to remind you that it was your job to protect me, but even when you commandeered that battle lord, the enemy made mincemeat of you. I sometimes wonder how you became squadron leader. Yeah, well, let me tell you, Miss Commander, that fighting that alien was no walk in the park. I know, I'm just scared, Rick. What plans do you suppose the enemy has in store for us? I'm working on my own plan. Oh, huh? oh Lieutenant, oh, Commander Hayes, I didn't miss lunch, did I? <laughs> I love Ben. Outside the ship, a lone blue Veritech moves along its hull, observing damage from previous battles in one section, with holes big enough for a battleoid to squeeze through. Max notes that although the Zentradi seem to like to fight, they don't seem to care much for repairs and maintenance on their stuff. That suits him just fine, seeing as how it just provided a way for him to get inside and hopefully find the others. I think it's notable that Max could have just returned to base at any time. But he's not the type of guy to leave his squad behind. Lisa finds a silver lining in her captivity. She's still on a recon mission after all, so she uses a tiny micro-video camera to record anything and everything inside this alien vessel. Even though Ben smiles at the dedication Lisa is putting into her duty, Rick nonchalantly dismisses the notion considering their circumstances. There's about to be a whole lot more intel to gather though, as Britai orders his ship to fold back to the Zentradi main fleet and their home base. The alarm Lisa and Rick feel as they sense the fold is incalculable, putting the odds of ever getting back to the SDF-1 near zero. On the battle fortress, this fold is detected by the bridge crew who note it occurred in the same area Lisa and Vermilion squad had been in. The fact that they haven't been able to raise them on the comms for some time, along with this fold, is taken as a grim omen by Captain Glovel. Roy had been worried about Rick's disappearance, but knows he wouldn't be the only one. He figured Minmay would want to know, and patiently waits for her to inevitably show up at her family's restaurant. When she does, along with some friends or groupies, it's hard to tell. 
She's curious to see Roy, but it seems strange he's there without Rick. Min Mei, despite her bubbliness, isn't stupid. She had probably imagined this possible conversation at some point, the kind of conversation you have with a serviceman after a loved one has been killed in action. She keeps a brave face in approaching Roy, but the seriousness of his expression, his eyes filled with empathy, lead Min Mei to think the worst has happened to Rick. Roy tries to convince her that there's still a possibility Rick is fine, but wanted her to know he is currently MIA. Still, that's all Min Mei can take, as she runs away, eyes filling with tears, while Roy explains to her friends that she may need some time alone. It's notable that Min Mei would go to the very park where Rick had saved her life, and not for the first time. The very spot where he told her he was going to join the military. Min Mei, I'm gonna do it. Huh? I'm gonna join the defense forces. Oh. Even the beauty of the ship's artificial sky went unnoticed, as Min Mei is lost in contemplation, remembering Roy's words. I'm only saying that we've lost contact with him temporarily. He's dead? No, please stop. Don't assume he's dead. We don't know that. Even if Rick was still alive, he was lost in the sea of stars. And Min Mei realized she may never see him again. Winning Miss Macross had been a dream come true, of course. Min Mei had been on Cloud Nine ever since that day, doing promos and interviews, ramping up to the big debut concert that would elevate her to true celebrity. And she loved telling Rick all about it. Well, let me hear it. <laughs> the title's kind of silly. The name I made up is My Boyfriend's a Pilot. Isn't it dumb? Uh, what's dumb? <laughs> you sometime. She'd wanted to tell him everything, but she'd just been so busy. She wanted to see Rick more and tried to talk to him when she could, but with her debut and everything all approaching so fast, and Rick had been so supportive. And now that day had come, and all she could think of was that he wasn't here with her to see it. But she could at least put on a smile and a show. And as much as she hoped Rick was out there somewhere, and would one day come back to her, she could inspire that hope in the people of Macross, the SDF-1, and maybe one day, the world. As her concert kicked off, the feeling of it, of her music and voice, truly sparked that hope and joy in the people aboard the ship. Especially for Roy, who missed Rick dearly. But with Claudia by his side and Min Mei's songs emanating, he felt a true connection. A connection to this family on board the ship and to his little brother, who he knew was out there somewhere. would like to know where these bruisers are taking us. If you want to know the truth, I'm not sure I'm so anxious to find out. Wow, it's been almost 10 Earth days since we began this fold operation. I'll bet a lot has happened in Macross City. That what? long? That long. Time almost seems to stand still during fold operations. I'll be darned. Min Mei's already had her debut, I guess. That's right. Min Mei's debut. Rick retreats into himself at the mention of Min Mei rather wishing that Ben hadn't brought it up. As time passes, the ship finally defolds, and just as the trio are wondering where they might be, Ben cries out in shock. Out the window, they observe so many Zentradi ships. Thousands, maybe millions. As Lisa records with her camera, Rick points out a glimmering cluster of lights that their ship seems to be headed right towards. The lights belong to a ship so huge it could fit hundreds of SDF-1s inside. The fleet surrounding this large vessel is staggering in its numbers. Britai's own humongous nine-mile-long craft is welcomed inside this gigantic main ship. As it makes its way towards the center, 
we find Max making his way through Brita's ship, hoping to find where they've taken his friends. It was such a big ship. Seems that its personnel was pretty spread out. But even still, he spies some Zentradi officer coming his way and tiptoes, as best a giant mech can, to a nearby closet. At least he thought it was a closet, but the contraption inside looked suspiciously like a commode. Well, the odds of that officer needing to use the head were pretty slim, right? Sure enough, the door unlatches, and it's tough to say who was the more surprised. But either way, Max was faster, kicking the Zentradi right in the gut with a powerful robotic leg, catching him as he folds, and pulling him inside. And of course, turning the lock to Occupado. It took a little patience, a bit of trial and error, and a lot of luck, but Max is able to pull off the clothes from the Zentradi officer and dress his battleoid in them. Though he admits it's not the greatest fit, his sensors show him some funky proportions, but it'd have to do. It didn't take long to find a chance to test the disguise, and Max holds his breath as he passes the soldier, who spares him only the briefest glance, but continues on. Max exhaled in relief, and just hoped that guy didn't have to use the bathroom. Ritai's flagship enters the center of this massive vessel, the inside containing several dozen more ships, as well as some amount of atmosphere. In an effort to contain any chance of some kind of contamination, Lord Dolza boards Britai's ship, where Exidor, Britai, and the three spies, Rico, Conda, and Braun, await his eminence. Lisa, Rick, and Ben are in the center of what to them was a huge conference table. They stood defiantly, ready for anything, waiting for who knows what. Lisa just wanted to make sure to capture whatever this event was. Out of the shadows, a bald Zentradi bigger than the one Rick fought walks to the head of the table, wrapped in simple yet regal gray robes. It's clear he's in charge, but more than that, he's able to introduce himself in the language of the Micronians. Welcome aboard, Your Majesty. The Micronians are ready. Greetings, Earthlings. My name is Dolza, Commander-in-Chief over all forces of the Zentradi. You will now submit to my interrogation. He speaks our language. I know, I don't believe it. Well, well, huh? well, 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 well. It seems it's our it's communication is so working. Tell us what you know of protoculture. You, the chubby one, answer his majesty. Forget it. I don't know anything about it. You're lying. Why do you insist on attacking us? You're the guys that are attacking us. You deny you've made a secret weapon? And what is your knowledge of protoculture? Just a minute, nobody here has the slightest perception. Enough, Ben. Lisa was trained on how to handle interrogations and felt it was time to assert her position and the rights of her men under her command. Dolza is both amused and annoyed at this. So the little female is in charge here. It seems you are drastically underestimating the seriousness of your predicament, young lady. Dolza begins some recording or simulation showing the dominance he wields with his fleet boasting that he could, at a whim, destroy the Micronian's battle fortress, all the people aboard, and even their entire planet Earth, with the wave of his hand. Having seen the fleet outside, this threat was certainly not empty. This power was truly awesome, astonishing, even shocking. Despite the awe and grandeur, Lisa decides to call it as a bluff. There must be a reason they choose not to destroy us. I don't think you have enough power. Impertinence! Are you crazy? Let me handle this. The SDF-1 has much greater power than this bucket of balls. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Commander, look out! Oh, oh. Hey, what do you think you're doing with her? Remain in your place. And <laughs> now, my feisty female, I want to know by what process you become Micronians. Answer me at once! No! Stop squeezing her! We're born into this world as Micronians. Born, did you say? Yes, but born from what is the question? 
Well, from our mothers, what do you think? What is this thing, mothers? That's the parent who's female. You don't mean you are actually born from these females? But how is this possible? Look, it's like the birds and the bees. It's no big deal. It's just a process of nature. When a female and a male love each other, it just happens. Rick couldn't believe he and Ben were having to explain this stuff to anyone, let alone giant alien people, or that they seemed more interested in sex than in the SDF-1's capabilities, movements, or strategic plans. But Britai pressed on in this questioning, as the Zentradi must get to the bottom of whatever the Micronian psychological weapon they employ is. How does it work? And what are these words? Parent, mother, and love. This love, what is it? How do you express it? Well, by kissing one another. And so we are to believe that's how Micronians are made? Why don't we see right now by having you both kiss one another? What? You can't be serious. There's no way I'm going to kiss him. Demonstrate this kissing or I'll crush all of you. Wait! I'll be the one to demonstrate. Mm, well, all right. Make sure you do. So, now, listen, Lieutenant Hutter, I want you to kiss me. Huh? I want to get their reaction on my video recorder. All right, then, but why don't you do it with Ben? Because I'd rather do it with you, Rick. Then you'd better make it a command. It's not that Lisa wasn't... kissable. It's just she's probably the last woman Rick had ever hoped to kiss. Plus, like, the giant alien with the thing on his face was looking at them so intently. But orders are orders, although he felt some betrayal towards Minmei. You will now proceed. I'm giving you a direct order. Whatever you say, Commander. Are you ready? Yes. Forgive me, Min May. In this moment, despite his loathing for Lisa, the fact that the room ceased to be, the giants looking at them, that the entire universe stopped the instant his lips touched Lisa's, ignited an undeniable spark within Lieutenant Hunter, one that seemed mutually shared by Miss Hayes. Even as they parted, and the universe came crashing in around them once more, they had barely registered the extreme reaction of their captors at seeing such a sight. The three spies are abhorred. Even Britai and Exodor are speechless. Dolza registers the seriousness of this weapon, this effect, this culture, and the implications of it all. Disgusted, he orders these Micronians to be removed from his sight at once. After their dismissal, the Zentradi counsel together, unable to pinpoint exactly what caused their own reactions to the Micronians and their kiss. Dolza insists this means the Micronians have access to the very secrets of protoculture. By the request of the three spies, Dolza divulges the classified meaning of protoculture. At this time, it's kept rather vague to the other Zentradi, as well as to us, the audience. And we will go through the meanings and definitions of protoculture, in Robotech and Macross both, in a future episode. Suffice it to say for now, all Dolza admits is that protoculture is the essence of all their technology and society, or at least, the society that the Zentradi derived from, before they evolved into their giant warrior race. But its very secrets were lost, hidden by the Robotech master Zor, and sent across the galaxy. Which is why it is imperative they capture the battle fortress of Zor, the SDF-1. Lisa, Ben, and Rick are placed in a large empty room to act as a holding cell, with Lisa feeling powerless as she watches the metal doors close. They make themselves at home as best they can as they try and process everything they just experienced. That was the strangest thing I've seen. I mean, you and the lieutenant just kissed one another, and the monsters seem to be scared half to death. You're right. And when you realize they have enough power to blow up the rest of the world, why would something like that scare them? 
I would like to know what all this protoculture business is they keep talking about. We've seen that their society has no civilians, and that the men and women aren't to come in contact with one another, and they don't have any children. Yeah, well, all I know is that I don't want to live somewhere where you can't even have a girl. You know what I mean, Lieutenant? Right. Well, one thing I'm sure of is when we return to the ship, this videotape will give us some answers. You mean, if we return to the ship? Enough of that, Ben. The mission was the only thing keeping Lisa going, holding back the despair she felt looking at that massive metal door locking them in. But what Lisa didn't know was they'd been seen on their way to this cell by a figure in a green Zentradi officer's uniform concealing a blue battleoid underneath. And the pilot of this mecha, the man behind the battleoid, was their one chance to escape. <laughs>